Hello and welcome. I'm Kylie Stone, your coach in creating a new paradigm of leadership. Today, we are talking about the role of a leader as a coach. And I am absolutely delighted to say that today, to join me for this conversation, is the expert in this area uh, and has written a book actually titled uh, The Leader as a Coach, Jim Grant. Uh, Jim has worked with over 200 organisations around the world. He's been in the rooms where decisions are made on the development of leadership, organisational culture and creating high performance teams. He has authored three books. Um, he's a 22 year veteran as a consultant in this space. And so today I, I'm really, you know, thrilled to be able to bring Jim in for this conversation on many fronts. Um, firstly, because I think, uh, you know, certainly it's not my area of expertise when it comes to the development of leadership specifically, but also because of this transition that I think all of us would acknowledge we're now facing. Uh, which is a very different paradigm in the in the distinction of leadership from what leadership was certainly when I started my journey uh, many years ago uh, and to what it is now today. So firstly, I do want to start by saying thanks for joining me, Jim. It's a great pleasure, Kyle. It's a privilege. Thank you. And the, whilst, uh, you know, just before you and I jumped on, of course, you know, we, we are here to talk about this, this book that you've published previously uh, around the distinction of a leader as a coach. And we'll well, we will come to that in a minute. But the other thing I want to make time for today, Jim, is something that you've just mentioned to me that you've got running in, starting in March, uh, which is this online program that you've wrapped everything that you've learned over the years into a program for emerging leaders. So please do, make sure we don't, don't forget about that. I want to make sure we, we dig into that. Right, thank you. So um, before we get into the, your story, uh, I want to take a step back in time, Jim, because um, let's just say 1991 was when I was my first year into the workforce. And back then, the journey to leadership was fairly standard. You know, you would kind of develop yourself in an area of expertise in one of three areas. You know, you'd either become a technician, you know, like a plumber or a hairdresser, for example, which my mother, God bless her, was when she first started. And shout out to my mother, now an academic and the head of the business unit in, in Indigenous Affairs, miraculous. Um, but you'd start either as a technician, you'd go down the functional area of expertise, you know, so sort of you'd either go into either sales or marketing or, you know, some functional area. Um, and then, of course, you might go down a professional domain. You know, you might go into law or accounting and, and quite frankly, once you developed, um, you know, what should I say developed, probably more proved yourself, right? Once you proved your expertise, you'd, you'd climb the ladder and you'd get a promotion and then you'd rise up and you'd rise up and it was more like a ladder, right? And so that certainly was my experience um, in, in the journey of leadership. And then once you got to a leadership role, you, you really were directing employees who had a good knowledge of the business and how they could then develop them themselves and their expertise and so on. Right. Yeah. But as you and I know, uh, Jim, it, it, it's a, that's no longer enough. You know, it's sure, sure there's the foundations, but there is a, there is a lot more to it. And I, I really want to start there with you because, you know, you have been in this game for a, for, with experience, not just in developing leadership specifically as a consultant, but you've got a diverse career covering union leadership. You've been a teacher. So can we start with your, your story and your journey as a leader? Yeah, that, that would be that would be great. So teaching was my, my first occupation, other than the holiday jobs in factories doing things in horrible environments. Um, and I taught in uh, sort of at Coburg High School, um, which was a fascinating school because it was about seventy percent of the student population was non-born Australian family. So, and it was just it was just fabulous. So, and you got sort of plunged into leadership positions with nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. You know, will you be the year 10 coordinator or you run the legal studies practice? And you had, you had no, absolutely no clue what to do. And so you relied on the odd role model or tapping somebody on the shoulder and saying, please, what do I do now? Uh, and and you, you just churned along. And, and then, I, you know, then I joined the union movement uh, and... After about four or five years, I became the head of the teacher unions in, in Victoria. And, and similarly, you know, you just relied on having good folk around you who helped you out. 
And I kind of look back at that now and say to myself, I wish I'd known, I wish I'd understood, I wish I'd grasped that. I, I wish I understood the magnitude of it or the responsibility that it in, entails. And, and to me, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of being a parent in the workplace. It's, it feels very much like it. Uh, and, you know, we're parenting, we get kind of thrown in a little bit too, don't we? But we totally. should, no, yeah, no, but how many times you hear people say, oh, I wish we had a book on how to be a great parent, although yeah, you know, yeah, let's, there um, are thousands of books on it, right? But that certainly just doesn't seem to cut it. No, so you, so you talk to your friends and you gather around you, people who've got kids and you exchange stories and you learn as you go and, and then and look back in horror and glee. You look at both. You say, well, that worked and that didn't work. And now I'm a grandfather, so now I'm at least theoretically wise and helping out. And that's a very, very different experience. So after that, I joined the corporate world. I was really lucky. I got tapped on the shoulder to join the famous ICI at a, at a fairly young age, which was really surprising because guy from the union movement, that ICI were very enlightened because they were actually deliberately looking for people from the union movement. Mm. So, so we've got plenty of you know, corporate bodies there. We want something different. So five of us were brought in literally without portfolios to learn the ropes. Can you, you imagine the privilege of that? For six months, we just want you to understand the business and we want you to understand what we make and who we are and what we do and what our values are, and we'll find something for you. So I look back at that and think, wow, that is something. And I build that into my current thinking about the work I do right now. You know, does it have to be six months? No, but it has to be taken seriously. And so when you moved into a leadership position there, you were truly well-educated. You know, there were core leadership programs, there were coaches, there were role models, there was there were materials. You know, you didn't you didn't get plunged anywhere without support. And that experience was so wonderful. It was really the seed of the inspiration for imagine what that would be like if we could do that elsewhere. Mm. So moving on to other corporations, um, that I was I was in a position where I could pick that up and lead that. And then, uh, 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 and that included all sorts of industries like mining and agriculture and petrochemicals. And then uh, I thought, gee, I'd love to do this for a living. <laughs> Wouldn't this be good if I could take this stuff out into the world? And so consulting became 23 years ago my, my mm. occupation. And as you said, I work with well over 200 companies and any number of CEOs and, and the most exciting group, the young and emerging leaders who are just amazing. Mm. And that's a, that's a wonderful part of our work. Mm. And so now you're, uh, so where are you at now? What What's the primary focus for you these days? Well, it's it's, it's narrowed a little because you, you I can, because I can, uh, to be honest, without sounding boastful. So uh, uh, there's four things. One, I do a lot of work on organisational culture. You know, what is the culture? What is the ambition around culture? And what are the steps and processes you need to, to get a really constructive culture? And I just wanted to say on that it isn't just about behaviour, it's also about systems, processes, structure. And people often forget it. They think, oh, if we just do the, the course, we'll be okay. Yes. Uh, so the bit of, bit of work's hard to do and there's clutter and noise and bureaucracy, you're not going to get a good culture. So that's one. Yes. The second is we, we still do leadership development, um, but it's very focused now. It's, it's mostly with senior groups. Um, uh, I do an enormous amount of coaching. That would be 50% of my working life at the one-on-one -on -one stuff. So at the moment, probably 30, 40 people I'm coaching. Mm. And that mostly CEOs, senior execs, but not, uh, not necessarily. And we do a lot of work with senior executive teams, helping them to understand themselves, become collaborative, become high performing. And they all kind of gel. They all sort of sit. And often with a client, we do all of those things. Mm. Because they're, they're very congruent and they work well together. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things I'm curious about before, because we are. I do want to focus today um, on this this specific area of a leader as a coach, because I was yeah. really fascinated having read some of the material about about that, um, and certainly it goes to my view, or because I'm not, you know, I'm un, unlike most people who work in the area of leadership development, um, you know, tend to come from a background in HR or, yeah. uh, you know, some 
you know, learning and development space, right? So, um, but that, not the case for me. So my, 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 certainly my growth in this area came from my experience really in leadership roles themselves. Yes. Uh, and then facilitating mostly in transformation. So more experiential, like how do I have the experience of yeah. uh, expressing yeah. myself as a leader? So I'm, I'm interested in a couple of things um, before we do get into that coaching thing. Just to one, one that what you said about culture uh, you know, not only being about behavior. And I do think there's probably a myth there that we, you know, certainly I, I would have to call myself out on that about. I lost you, Carly, sorry. Can you hear me now? Oh, that would be great. Uh, Certain this time of day when we have a, a Wi-Fi <laughs> connection, uh, we, we will come back to the cut on that one. Um, but the, the first. You're back now. Great. So the first. So I missed the last thirty seconds. So the first thing I want to ask you about is this thing about culture, because I have to call myself out and say I too uh, have made the mistake in assuming that the work on culture is about uh, changing purely behaviours. Right? You know that culture is all about the the, the behaviour part, but you did mention the importance there of systems, and so is that part? Can you just tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, so it's, so I'm not I'm not pushing away from behaviour is is anything other than central, and, and leadership behaviour is more than central. But if you haven't got um, great work processes, easy ways of accessing data, uh, systems that actually work and make life life easy and access, and, and I don't mean easy as in lazy easy. <laughs> if you haven't got a structure that really works, and you haven't got role clarity. You can do all the behavioural stuff you like. People will still feel like they're working in noise and clutter. And so they will be critical about the culture. They'll say, look, I've got a nice boss and there's a lovely environment, but I can't get anything done. Uh, it's so yeah. frustrating you know, working around here. Yes. So we measure both and address, address both uh, because they, they sit hand in glove. But one without the other doesn't work in, in culture. Yes. You know, now that you've said that, I'm kind of reminded also uh, of this this distinction between what what we desire and what we think is a good thing to do versus the actual practical application right and so yeah. and by that i'm referring to i mean god i mean the amount of times i'd done some uh, and this is no disrespect to, the, to the, the process of this because it's highly valuable, but, you know, the emotional intelligence surveys, the leadership styles reports, you know, the, there's varying kind of approaches, right? 360 degrees. Yep. But, um, it's one thing to do those things, right? And you can do them and get a level of awareness about yourself. But I, you know, I, I, I remember so many times being in those meetings as an executive and the confront that it was for some people to kind of firstly uh, get a level of insight about who they thought they were versus what the results were saying from their peers. And, 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 but the little difference it makes if, if, you know, that's only just one layer. It's like, it's great once you've got that, but un unless there's a tangible uh, or so say practical approach to implementing change, is it going to make any difference? It's not going to make any difference except for awareness. So, you know, there, there's some real, real value in awareness. Um, you know, you, people, people speculate all the time about uh, how they're coming across and they don't really know. Um, you know, I find it I, I find it really frustrating that people don't pulse check one of the most important things you can pulse check. Yes. You know, if I said to them at the head of sales, don't worry about checking your sales numbers for the year, we'll just get in a room and add them all up. <laughs> Or the finance guy, they think you're completely insane. That's so right. We that about leadership all the time. We just trundle along and think it's okay. And then suddenly you get a survey and you go, oh my goodness, <laughs> um, I didn't know that. Well, you should know that. You don't need a survey to know that. You should be asking pulse check questions constantly. Then when you've got the survey, you're absolutely right. What, what's the action plan? Yeah. What are you going to do about this? How are you going to validate it? How are you going to feed it back to your team? How will you track and monitor it? And who's going to support you? Coach, for example, your boss, your peers. Um, you know, it's a, bit, it's a bit like somebody who does a, an AA program. Well, why do they work? You've got, <laughs> you've got a buddy. You've got a, That's right. a program. You've got a pulse check. You've got an action plan, you know. Mm. So without it, it's interesting, insightful data and not much else. So yeah. we, we, we literally won't do it unless we get agreement on the, on the bits that follow. 
Mm, mm, that's fantastic. Well, you're speaking to the converted as a background. I know, I know. <laughs> background in research. I'm like, where's the data? <laughs> and so uh, let's jump into this conversation about the one of the books that you've authored called uh, The Leader as a Coach, yeah. uh, which oh, God, I just love that title, by the way. I, it's a whole new view, I think, for, and you know, let's, let's be honest. I think many people in leadership know that the value they provide is moving more in that direction. And, um, but I think it's also important to, Jim, I want to start this conversation by highlighting specifically what your uh, what what you would say what we mean by coaching because coaching is very different to being a mentor and it's certainly very different to what you know I experienced as in leadership you know my early days. So can we start there? Yeah, of course. So I have a I have a kind of you could call it a really narrow view, but it's a view I think works for us and. And, and I agree with you. So coaching for us and the context in which we write the book is coaching is a style of leading. And there are many styles of leading. It's one. And I want to kind of contextualise that because to go to the idea that if you coach, everything will be okay is a myth. It's an absolute myth. But there's a time to be directive. There's a time to be friendly and affiliative. There's a time to be participative. There's a time to give clarity. I could go on and on and on. So coaching is a style of leadership um, and it's a style which has an obsessive preoccupation around personal growth. Mm -hmm. That is, that's what it's all about. So and what often happens and, and is that people will say, I coach a lot. And when you actually analyse that, they don't. They have a lot of conversations or they'll tell people how to do the job or they'll give them advice, but there's got nothing to do with coaching because they're in their head there's no growth brain going on. Mm. So if you're not thinking, how is this useful for the development of this person, you're almost certainly not coaching. If you're giving the answers, you're almost certainly not coaching. Mm. So it's a way of leading. And we know from the evidence that it's a profoundly good way of leading because it gets great outcomes around engagement and development, but it's badly done mm. frequently. Now, can I ask you about that? So did, how did you get uh, insight onto the fact that it was doing badly? Because I, uh, is, you, know, you know, I suppose I'm going to my data lens, right? You know, and, and I know for myself, I think I've you know, messed, messed up many times thinking I've probably done a great job as a coach when I think it's not coaching really, right, based on what you say. So how do you, how have you seen that? What, what, do, what do you say, see people are doing that they think is coaching when it's really not? Well, we, we do, do pretty sophisticated leadership diagnoses, as and you've been through them. And so that, that will give you some pretty good data on the, the volume of coaching uh, and people's perceptions around that. And so there's a bit of a shock factor there, as I, as I indicated. On one hand, some people who say, well, I don't have any formal coaching sessions and they get really high ratings on coaching. Right. Because they have constant dialogue which says, what did you learn? How would you do that better next time? What insights did you gain? Now, the informality, the corridor coaching, and, of course, you get the reverse of that. So what we did with that data is we dissected it and said, okay, what's the, what is this actually telling us? And then we went back to people who had filled out surveys and said, okay, what's the, what's the actual experience of that? And what we found is that people, um, there was a mythology about it, you know, and I've, I've described the mythology. I talk to my people all the time. What do you mean I'm not coaching? Well, talking to people all the time might, and I'm not saying that's not useful. It can be very useful, but it's not coaching because it, coaching is developmental and it's a two-sided coin. You, you're, you're partnering in a, per, in a person's evolution. That's very different than helping somebody with a task or giving them advice. And it requires real discipline. So I'll give you an example of this. We, we run coaching pro, training programs. And about towards the end of the first day, we say, let's, let's try this. Find somebody and coach them on an issue or a topic. And I and I've told them maybe eight times, don't give advice. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you half the room within 15 minutes is giving advice. <laughs> <laughs> it's so obvious, you know. How, well, yes. I've done this before. I know what yes. to do. Here you go. You're yes. out of the court. Bye bye. Yes, yes, yes. yes. No price, but they've got a solution. Yes. And, and I think that the word solution is really paramount for us too. If, if you leave a coaching session without something to do, without an action or a solution, you've just had a chat. Mm. And, and, and the whole issue about you know, get out of the problem and get into the solution is the mm. core skill. 
in mm. coaching. I'm really happy to talk about, about that. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, know, I do recall reading a bit about the approach you've taken to provide people with some kind of resources and tools on how you take them through the process. Yeah. Are, there some, are there some certain things that you discover? Well, what are some of the key things or key processes that you would, you would highlight? Look, there's there's a lot, but if I can pick a couple that that yeah, I right. got any you know, other magic <laughs> magic tricks, if you like, well, I'd say one one is that it's it's rarely the case that getting embedded in the problem leads to a good coaching solution. Mm-hmm. And I'll kind of give you an example of, of what I mean by that. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I was coaching an operations director who I reckon he spent twenty minutes telling me about how irritating two or three people on his team were. <laughs> You know, you really could have flip chart the walls with all the issues. It would have been 50 <laughs> issues. Yes. Now, I don't know about you, Kylie, but I can't coach the 50 issues, and he certainly can't handle 50 issues. And this was quite an accident. I just stopped and I said, what I don't understand is what you actually want from these people. See the solution shift? Mm. And it really distressed him. He took almost five minutes to be able to answer that question because he'd never thought about it. He was so embedded in the world of problems, he hadn't thought of solutions. And he came back and said, well, when I, first of all, he sort of mildly cursed me for asking the question. And he says, there's only a couple of things I want, I really want. And one of them was actually his problem and one was a genuine problem. And we had a great coaching conversation about how he would solve that problem. So, and notice how linguistic that is. You know, what do you want? Uh, uh, if I can give you, can I give you one other example? I think yes, please. Probably, Great. Examples are probably the, the best. So, so never forget the use of language in coaching. It's mm. so important. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in a team meeting at in my business and we're doing a round the table, how are you going, thing as you do. And we got to one person and I said, how are you going? And she said, and I quite over, and this is 15 years ago, I'm the worst person in the administrative team at everything. That's what she said. Now, can you imagine the endless possibilities in response to that that you could take? That just, you could write a list as long as you're on. Now, the typical typical response would be an empathic response, you know, hug, no, you're not, you're really wonderful. But that doesn't, that keeps you in the problem. So so all I said, and this was, again, accidental and then created stuff in the book, the worst at everything, are you telling me you're the worst at everything? That's all I said. And she said, well, no, not everything. Mm. I said, well, what are you doing well? And she listed off three or four things she was doing well. Mm. I said, let's go back to the couple of things you're struggling with and we'll have an offline conversation about it. Mm. Now, that is that is magic in coaching. Mm. It's a construct that works 90% of the time because people get messed up yes. in that kind of defeatist language and you've got to switch the dialogue around and it's oh. clear. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, I always like to dob myself in because, you know, being a coach, I don't, I don't talk too, too publicly about my <laughs> clients. But, you know, uh, when you go back 15 years in time, clearly it's an easy thing to talk about. But, you know, look, I've done it for myself. I mean, I think, you know, I think our default as a human being to generalise when there's a disaster, you know, like when yeah. you think, you think, you know, well, I think one of the ones I hear a lot actually is especially in the era of people building businesses and, you know, is the constant experience of failure. And whilst, and, and they then they generalise called, yep. I'm, I'm a failure, or, you know, I'm such oh, a yeah. failure, it's never going to yeah. work out. And you go, well, yeah. really? Yeah. Um, so I, it, it's a fascinating, I think it's a really a piece of gold there, Jim, because, you know, I think when you get out of the generalisation, generalised statements about one's performance and then you break it down, it's just a very different view, right? It's sizing the problem so that you can manage exactly right. So whenever I hear the word never, I just repeat back, never, never, ever, ever, not in up till hell freezes over. Oh, no, I don't mean never. And then you can have a constructive conversation. Yeah. So so listen to the words is a really good coaching tip. And and don't say a lot. Do a lot of listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So another question for you. I want to talk about this um, opportunity of actually embedding coaching within the organisation because I know, you know, it's one thing to bring in people like yourself and myself as a consultant or a coach, right, Uh, and to work behind the scenes. And that's one level. But I think what we're talking about now, and certainly because I know that you're doing the work of training people in the area of coaching and how to be a coach as a leader, um, it, it, I think is the importance of what do you think is required, in, especially in the early onset, about how to embed this approach. Because 
I, I think one of the biggest obstacles we now face is that things are moving so fast and leaders have so much on their plate. You know, they're expected to do more with less and they've got less time. And one of the biggest complaints I get, Jim, is that people struggle to get time in the diary with their, with their leader uh, to have these kind of conversations. And yet we know that, that actually you'd be more productive by having them. So how, do you, how are you dealing with that to have people embed this process or uh, take this approach? Yeah, well, well there's, there's two approaches and one I really like and one that makes me nervous, frankly. So the one that makes me nervous is when they nominate internal mentors and they have sort of the internal gurus and you get your session every month. Now, that, I think that has a place, but I don't think it gets your real organisational traction. Whereas developing as part of the leadership suite coaching skills, and, and they really are skills, tips, techniques, uh, approaches, um, some of the stuff I've talked about, and making that part of the leadership lexicon and putting value on it, is where it really, really starts to take hold. And we, we've measured this. We've measured time one, time two impact of this. And it's it, when it's done like that, it, it has, has serious impact. My only caveat on that is the one I mentioned before, is people can get carried away that that's the solution to everything, and it, it is not. It's a development option. So if that's, your, that's the preoccupation, it's a wonderful way to do it. But I, I don't think you can embed it unless you develop the skills of it. And you develop it as a line management skill, not so I don't not some special thing that you you know you've got a mentor or tick off you go. Yes. That's, I don't think that's the way to go. And and okay, now great question because there are many people who I think in the, in the area of line managers, right? I think you're spot on. Uh, I've worked with a number of people who work specifically in the area of sales, uh, yeah. and where they've got a line management report where they're developing people specifically and increasing revenue, right? So that's probably one of the easy parts to go as a line manager is called. Well, how do I develop other people? Well, actually take more of a view called there's no nothing you need to tell them but more about questioning so so but yeah. one of the challenges that the people certainly i've been working with is the investment yeah. um the investment from uh let's i'll just call it i suppose the human resources budget line you know and being able to develop talent um is is mi minuscule not available that lack of funding i mean how how do these people deal with that well, a couple of things you mentioned also time. So there's time, there's time and effort involved in this. Um, well, firstly, I don't always believe it. That's the first thing. So I'd, I'd say really and challenge it. You know what do you what do you actually mean by that? Um, um, but but secondly, you it, once you've got the skills in place, at least an acceptable level, there's a kind of mythology about this that it's an exhausting, time-consuming process, and it doesn't need to be. That's, that's putting aside that it's an investment that pays off when well done. That's a, that's a whole other topic that's very evidence-based. But I, I, if you simply change the dialogue as often as you're able to a coaching conversation, in five minutes, you can be coaching. And I, I mentioned some before. What did you learn? What insights have you got? How would you do that differently next time? People will, they will feel coached. And when you assess that, Tick, I'm being coached. You know, we know that. We know that from the data that we've seen how often the informal coach gets highly rated as a coach. Mm. Because their head is always sitting or, or appropriately sitting in development and growth. Mm. So if someone comes in with an issue, what goes on in your brain as, as the leader? So if, you, if it's, let's, let's fix this quickly, oh, that's fine. I, I don't have a problem with that. But if you think, learning opportunity, I'm talking five minutes. Literally five minutes. Mm. And so let's kill the, you have to have hours and hours in your diary. That's nice yeah, and valuable. I'm not saying don't do that. Mm. But don't underplay how you convert, you can convert dialogue into coaching dialogue. Mm -mm. Mm. Uh, great. Well, I think there's two things I'm hearing in that. One is I think there's a responsibility that we can take on both sides. Um, you know, it, 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 especially the more senior you go, it doesn't mean just because you are, senior that you you can't knock on the door of someone yeah. uh either above you or beside you or even below you right depending yeah. on what what it is that you're dealing with and say hey can i have a conversation and can you provide some coaching for me you know here's yeah. here's here's what i need you know so i think i think there's a, an opportunity there from both sides you know how can we take ownership of getting what we need uh from a coaching conversation as much as as a leader 
noticing where we can see that it, that kind of conversation could make a difference for someone yeah. else and make yeah. the offer. Cause I think sometimes we also balk at, should I make the offer or suggestion, you know, because I think at the end of the day, everybody really welcomes the opportunity for, for even though sometimes, it, you know, it's not easy to get that you know, the hard stuff, but you know, at the end of it, we all, all do benefit from that growth, right? We do. And, and you may, it means being a little bit vulnerable, you know, but to be prepared to say, I need help. I, I value some advice. I'd like your insight. And if you're worried about coach, don't call it, call it what you like. I, I don't care. And if, if your objective is I want some learning and growth, uh, you know, yes. reach out, but it's, it's a vulnerability. Yes. Particularly when you're more senior, which is why a lot of CEOs have external coaches. Yes. Because they feel really lonely and a bit embarrassed to go and ask, and so they they go outside. You know, the yeah. really best CEOs I work with do both. Yeah, right. Like Coterie of people they're talking to at all levels. Yeah. Without labelling it, but it's 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 expressing vulnerability. I need help. I'm not perfect. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Uh, honestly, I, I I would dare say I, every senior level executive really should have a coach because it is a tough gig and you know it, there is a level of and one of the reasons I had a passion for starting this podcast Jim was because having been on both sides obviously once you've been a leader you've been on both sides right you've been under the directive of a leader and then you've been one right and and I think you know even from myself I think when I my actually was when I had my first role leading others and you know look back in those days it was more management than leadership right yeah. so but I, I do recall even for myself my own arrogance and my opinions about how now, the reason that everything was so screwed in the business was because of the poor job that the leaders were doing. And then as I got into a leadership role, I was going, oh my God, well, how goddamn rude of myself, you know, like the, the what you got to deal with. And, the, and, you know, and all this talk, and you know, uh, uh, you know, obviously I don't mean this literally for everybody, you know, when you're listening to this, but the, this whole new wave of being authentic and the expectation that if you're in a company and you want your leaders to be authentic, I do think we've got to have some compassion because, you know, what is authentic for a leader in a C-suite especially? Because there's a level of transparency one has to be very mindful about because we cannot, whatever comes out of our mouth, we say what we say, but we have no control over the perception or the interpretation of what gets said and then what comes of that. And I think that's a big risk in business. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued by the word authentic because I, I like it in, in the leadership sense, but I think it has walls and I think it has limits on it. Mm -hmm. So you often deal with CEOs who are really authentic, real people, but they can't just reveal everything. It's, it's not ethical and it's not appropriate. And sometimes it's not appropriate because it's irresponsible. Mm. You know, the, the leader that sort of gets out there and moans and groans about the board is actually not that helpful, you know. No. So I think you've got to be really clear about what, what authenticity is. And it means, you know, the person that you are at home is not a radically different one to the one at work, that there's some, and people see you for who you are and, and warts and all. But, but I, worry, I worry about it. But I, I would never say it in isolation. Mm. You know, the best ones I see are also courageous, um, they're also determined, they're incredibly disciplined. You know, they've got all the other bits that, that, that sit alongside it. Because we are getting towards the end, there's. I want to talk. Frozen again. So uh, let me know when it comes back in, Jim. Are we back in? Here we go. Are we back in? Yeah, I think we might be back in. Are we back in? Back now, yeah. Okay, great. So, um, Jim, as we come to the end, I did say at the beginning I wanted to talk to you about the next piece of work that you're doing um, around uh, emerging leaders, and you've got a program that you're going to start to launch. Uh, can you just tell us a what's it called and and what's it about? What's well, called mastering leadership excellence. Um, and it evolved from a, years and years of conversations with people who were doing our leadership programs who would say, as often as you can imagine, I wish I'd known that when I was 21 or 23 or when I first started out. I'm, I look at all, and me too, I look at all the mistakes I made. If only I had known that. Yeah. So we, we thought, okay, how do we do that? So it was really spending about six months assembling together all the kind of insights of whether it's coaching or emotional intelligence or collaboration I won't, I won't bore you with the list but so this is pitched at people who are in their first leadership job or job or who have ambitions to do it it's fully online 
Um, it's modular there, and we know from that work we did with that generation, they're like six or seven minute things. So it's, it's broken down into six or seven minute pieces. It has materials and presentations and links and all sorts of stuff. So it's like, you know, if, if your organisation is giving you nothing, come here. <laughs> and we, we're going to price it so that they can access it. So it's not meant for big corporate sales. It's So it'll be launched probably March uh, we, in the US and here. But the US is, uh, we, we, you know, I won't bore you with the logistics of it, but it's pretty exciting because I think it's a bit of a gap. Yeah, right. I, I, I totally agree. Uh, yeah, I've coached many people who are in their first level of leadership. And the reason they came to me was for that very reason. You know, there was very little available to them in that area. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm very, I'm looking forward to seeing it. So a couple of things I want to ask you. Um, first thing, I'm going to put your, you in the spotlight. Um, if you had to tell me some of the things, you know, I, you know, give me one, I don't mind, two, three, ten. Uh, what was at your, the top of your list when it comes to the regrets or wish you had a Known when you were back in the beginning of your days as a leader? Oh, goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I really, I really could give you a very long list. Um, I, I, I think the big one for me is that I had no understanding of the impact that I was having or could have. I mean, really none. And I look back now and I think, my goodness, you know, people, it's such a limbic thing. People observe and soak in what you say and you have a disproportionate impact on it everything that you interface with as a leader. I had no, no clue about that. And so I clumsily entered into dialogues and said things I probably shouldn't have and didn't really understand what I was accountable for or responsible for. And so I messed a lot of things up in hindsight. So do I regret, what I regret is there wasn't somebody there saying, hey, you know, help you out. Uh, and, and, and to be fair, I could have, I could have done that. And I did be, but looking back, and, and it's a bit like parenting too. I look back at my grown-up kids now and I think, oh my goodness, did I really say that? <laughs> oh, that's so funny you bring that up. And I'm so glad you said that actually, because my God, I was just recreated. Uh, and it was a combined experience. I remember in my role uh, at News Corp, I was a marketing director and I was pregnant with my second child. And uh, I had an interaction with one of with Oh, God bless him. I'm surprised he's still, he's unscathed. Um, but I must have combined hormonal at the same time. And I, my, my first child was, was only 10 months old. And then I was pregnant, like big pregnant. And I yelled at this guy, like, it's like <laughs> get in my office, hey, you know. And then uh, the next day I woke up and I went, oh, my God, what have I done? And I actually even thought to myself, oh, my God, this job of being a leader is just like being a parent. You do feel like at times you're behaving like a bad parent. <laughs> I, I remember a, a first year out graduate teacher and I was the coordinator of a subject coming to me and saying, can you help me? I'm really not familiar with the air. And I said, well, you've got to get there, go work it out. Yes. I actually said that. I, I looked at that. <laughs> Are you serious? Did you really say that? Oh, dear. And she teared up and walked away to the wilderness. Oh, gosh. Was, thank, just, God for, thank God for forgiveness, hey? Yeah. Um, a couple of other questions I want to ask you, Jim. If you were to highlight, uh, look, this is going to be a hard one, no doubt, but if you were to reflect on something that stands out for you as one of your greatest accomplishments in your journey, what's one of the things that stands out for you? Uh, look, anything that I would describe as an accomplishment is actually somebody else's accomplishment. I'm not being falsely modest there. I really, really believe that. So enabling people who, and I think a couple of really good examples, who are really struggling, you know, if I can give one example that sort of typifies it, was a person who um, was in a major hospital, a very senior role, who was struggling in lots of ways, you know, self-efficacy, uh, self-impression, imposter syndrome, you, know, you, you name it, the full suite. And we, we did a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with diagnosis, uh, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm genuinely not taking the credit for this. She grasped this with a passion that was astonishing and has become this profoundly brilliant leader in her sector, you know. She's a sort of an icon. She literally is an icon. She's a person. I follow her. I read her posts and say, wow. You, and I think, well, you know, what's that? That was a really interesting transformation. And it was because she, she desperate. She wanted it. She grasped it. She did everything she needed. She was brave. You know, she did, she's, the, she's my benchmark for that. So I'm proud of her. She's, mm. she's, she's extraordinary. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, on the flip side, what do you think is one of the biggest mistakes you've made? 
Oh, I, I, it's, I know from my corporate life, it's a really easy one is to not treat the frontline leaders with the respect they deserved. Right. Uh, and so what do I mean by that? So in my early corporate days, I was incredibly focused on the senior leaders, you know, working with them and the middle managers. And I had really, and I, I had really didn't have a lot of time for the front line. I thought, well, they're just, you know, they're just super by, they're just doing their job. Really silly, dismissive stuff. Mm -hmm. And it bit me badly right. because they're the messengers. They're the people who are most trusted. Mm -hmm. They're the people who are really committed to the role. You know, I changed it, but it took a couple of bad errors to, to work that out. And so... We, you know, we flipped that on its head after a while, but that was a really bad mistake. It caused a lot of pain. Mm, well, uh, I like the way that you're, uh, you know, because I think one of the things that is great, the great thing about us as humans, right, I think it's just the opportunity we have that's very distinct, is that even when you do screw things up, anything, yeah. anything can be recovered. Yeah. Uh, out of being in communication and taking responsibility for the impact and owning it and turning it around. And I, and I really respect that you've, uh, you know, I respect your uh, frankness and the, you know, and also the turnaround, you know, and the commitment to have it turn around. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Jim, to, to complete, one of the things uh, I'm interested in is your view on being a leader specifically. So if you can complete the sentence for me, um, a leader is someone who? <laughs> a leader is someone who has been given an onerous responsibility and privilege and needs to understand and value that and fight for the development and support they need to do it really well. Oh, I love that. And fight for, what's that? Fight for the development. And support they need to do it really well. Yeah, that's great. In fact, I'm reminded when you say that of what you shared about, um, you know, prior to us going online, you sent me some notes about the work you do. And uh, I asked you about the, your, your purpose, you know, and what it is that you're passionate about. And yeah. I'm reminded in there that you said that you were passionate about, you know, people having a say yeah. uh, and then getting the, the development that they, not yeah. only that they need, but they deserve, right? To have them utilize their skills and to, to be able to have the opportunity. And that, that sounds to me very much about what you're saying in your view of being a leader is that what would you say about that oh yeah absolutely so a leader that doesn't allow voices to emerge in an unfiltered way is not going to work very effectively and, and and development isn't some sort of nice to have this i think it's a human right you know um so and leaders have got an enormous responsibility there uh, you can't enable that human right unless you're listening to the voices mm got to be attentive to them and people you know as people speaking up uh, shouldn't be this courageous uh, you know aggressive thing it should be just a natural part of the, the, the dialogue and the discourse mm. you know you don't you, I hate sort of passive aggressive cultures because they just put people in a box yeah yeah well thanks for the conversation today Jim a couple of things that I do want to acknowledge and, and also if we can put links into the show notes is firstly that you have authored a, the book we've I mean, got three books right that are available from your website but the one that I want to play um, particular attention on is this book that you've got and, it, and it's just available off your website as a download called the the leaders the leader as a coach yep. uh, which is available both as an ebook but also as a printed version is that correct yes that's right yeah um, and also also, just one final shout out about this last the program that is now launching in the next coming in the coming weeks. Um, where can we go to find out more about that? Um, there will be a dedicated website, and it will be called the Jim Grant Institute, which sounds terribly immodest, but that's the marketer's dollars. Which that's the title which you do. Is that right? Uh, and we'll we'll get it out there in social media in a, in a significant way. Fantastic. Well, what we will do, so is make sure you go to the show notes. We'll put all the links to connect with Jim, uh, follow Jim on the various social media platforms. And also we will specifically put the links to the landing pages for both for the book, get yourself a copy of the leader as a coach. I do, I am interested in hearing from you about what you discover and please, it, you know, as always, I make a recommendation to take an action from what you discover and uh, Jim's approach is very practical. So download the book and, and uh, take the action just 
the first step that you can take that you can see to apply it. Um, we want to hear from you about what you discovered. So and I'm sure Jim would be delighted to hear about it. Um, and then also, if you're an emerging leader and you're not getting access to the resources that you need to help develop your skills, don't let that be a reason why you're not taking action. This program, by the sounds of it, that Jim's development, he has so much experience and knowledge. Um, I highly highly recommend i mean i don't have anybody on this podcast as you all well know um jim is a is a, is a reputable demonstrated success in this space so you know d don't let the lack of available opportunities in your organization stop you we will include the link to this program for jim and i highly recommend giving it a crack Thanks, Jim. Um, been absolutely delightful to, to connect and um, thank you for sharing your wisdom. It's an absolute pleasure. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thanks, Carly. Thank you.